Hello YouTube RJ. Hey, it's time to talk about the link shortwave receiver. I don't mean just talk about we're going to do it and you know it's coming. It's to talk about it. I've had quite a few people put comments in where they asked about, hey, can you give us some information? Give us some diagrams of how it works. You know, what's special about it? It's not really special. I just started out to try to design a very simple receiver that would work relatively well, that would be super easy to build, and it creates some really easy instructions to follow and just try to make a really good kit people would enjoy building. So I'm trying to do that. Now, maybe this never gets kit. Depends on the response I get, what people have to say in the comments. If no one's interested in it, it's not worth my time. Uh, it'll never be a money maker. As the guys at Solder Smoke like to say, you're never going to get rich doing this stuff. And I know, believe me, if you know my background, you know that I kitted electronic Christmas light controllers for about 10 years. I had very popular kits and it was never a money maker. In fact, I never really tried to make it a money maker. It was all about making a good kit for people to build, to enjoy, and be able to put these shows on and make people happy. And this radio is much like that. I'm not trying to make a bunch of money off of it or anything. It just interests me. So with that, let's talk about the Easy Shortwave Receiver. The Easy Shortwave Receiver again has some priorities to be easy to build to be low in part count try to keep the cost down but build something that you know you're proud to build when you're done you look at it and you show people you say look look what i built that's what my goal is and if we never kid it i build one and enjoy it turn it over my grandson to play with it was a successful project let's talk about how the design turned out I just received the boards in in fact here they are here's the first prototype board and it is a prototype it may well have changes because when you lay out, especially a complicated layout like this, sometimes you make mistakes. So I may build this and find out that, you know, I made mistakes. I have to redo it. I didn't even put Lynx graphics on it because I knew it likely would not be the finished product. You can see I've already put on the two surface mount chips in the design. It uses two 8831s. They are surface mount, not the easiest package to work with. So my idea is if we get these, you'll get the board just like this with it already on there. I'll have already put the chip on so you don't have to mess with that. This is the board. It's pretty compact. I tried to keep it under a size that would be very cost effective to have the board made. Looks like it has a lot of parts, but in reality it only has a few part numbers. It's pretty straightforward. I've already began on instructions. Just in case we ever end up getting this and putting it out, I want the instructions to be well written and work correctly. So I'm working on instructions before I even build the the board. My idea is probably the next video you'll get from me is I'm going to build this board using the instructions so I can find any mistakes or anything that is out of order or anything that doesn't work right. We'll get the board built. We'll give it a try. If it works well, great. If not, we'll find out what's wrong, tweak it some. That's just kind of filling you in on the whole idea and what I'm doing with this project. Now it's time to tell you about the design, the little differences and how I came up with this idea and, and what, what made me think this was the way to go. I knew I needed to create a receiver to put in the shootout to compete against the other kits we built. And as I was playing around, this idea popped in my head and I just had to try it and it seems to work. So let's jump on the computer, take a few minutes with me and let me walk you through the, the designs of different receivers and then the Lynx Easy shortwave receiver. You can see the difference in a, in a block diagram of the receiver and see the difference between other types of receivers. Okay, let's first take a look at a standard Super Heterodyne receiver design. So let's, let me pull this up. This is kind of a block diagram of what a super heterodyne receiver that would target like AM would look like. You have an antenna, of course, and it's going to come into a bandpass filter. Typically, your receiver is going to be targeting certain bands of frequencies, and you're going to have filters to keep everything outside those filters out of your way. After you've filtered out the things you don't want, you're going to go into an amplifier, typically to amplify the incoming signals. Usually, you'd want the bandpass filter in front of the amp because you don't want to amp the frequencies you don't want. So you want to knock them out first and then do your amplification. Now, after bringing that signal up, you would typically feed it into a mixer. And the reason you'd have the amp in front of the mixer here is because the mixer usually is going to want a fairly high drive. You know, if you're looking at a double balance diode mixer or even some of the ADE ones and such. They can be looking at like 7 dB, 10 dB expected input here. So you need a pretty good signal. So you need to amp this up. You're not going to get that kind of signal coming off your antenna. 
And of course your bandpass filters are gonna use a little of that signal up. You're gonna have a little bit of insertion loss. So you wanna amp it up high enough for the mixer to work properly. So you'll feed it into the mixer and then you'll have a VFO that will feed in your tuning frequency, your VFO signal in here to mix that will bring the incoming signal you're interested in and push it around until it lines up with the frequency of your crystal filter in the next stage. So whatever frequency is coming in, let's say this is a 10.7 megahertz filter, you're, you want to put a VFO signal into the mixer at such a frequency that when it's mixed, one of the products coming out is going to give you 10.7 megahertz. One of the products of the frequency you're looking at, you want to hear, is going to come out of this mixer pushed up to 10.7 or down, as the case may be. That will allow that signal to come through. Now, all these other signals are gonna be blocked because if they're not 10.7, this filter doesn't let them through. So the signal comes through and you get only the frequency you want, but you lost some signal in the crystal filter. There was insertion loss there, so you, you have an amp following it to boost the signal back up to give you enough signal to drive a detector, which is typically, you know, a diode based peak detector, or there's a couple of there's different detectors. The detector is going to pull off modulated signal and give you an output of audio. So because the detector is usually going to have a diode to rectify and get you that signal, but you also in a detector are going to have a low pass filter that will only pass frequencies easily in the audio range. So it should filter out, since we're talking a big difference here, 10.7 down to audio, 100 hertz to whatever, 3000, whatever your filter passed, you have a big separation between your high frequency and your audio. So it, it can effectively filter out and give you just the audio. The audio will come out of this stage and be amplified by amp into a speaker. So this is your typical situation. The detector is going to work on AM. It's going to make it where you tune an AM station. You don't have to be precisely on it. You won't be picking up the carrier sound heterodynes. They'll be filtered out. So it works well as an AM detector. One drawback to this design is you won't be able to receive CW and sideband. You're, you're going to pick up AM, but no CW or sideband. Let me close that out and we'll bring over our next design. Now the next design you see often is a direct conversion receiver. Very common in home building and such. It's very simple design. You typically have some kind of bandpass filter. They're usually designed for one, two bands of frequencies. Uh, you come out of the bandpass. Again, you have an amplifier going into a mixer. You have a VFO. The VFO, same thing as we did with the super heterodyne. The difference is we don't go into a frequency and into a crystal filter. Instead, we just take all of the frequencies that are passed by the bandpass filter, amplify them, put them in the mixer, and then we push the frequency around not to get it to a IF frequency that goes fits through a crystal. We look for the difference and we put a VFO frequency that brings the frequency we want to listen to down into the audio range. So you basically take your frequency and you mix it till you get a product that gives you a much lower frequency that's in the audio range. And then this audio is amplified by the audio, amp pushed out, and once again, you get audio. It works. Biggest drawback to this, you, you run into a situation where you do not have very good selectivity because you're not, you don't have a filter to try to cut out everything else. So selectivity can be an issue with this design. Uh, one, one positive is because the VFO is acting like a BFO, it kind of really is a BFO, you do get sideband and CW. These are very simple to build. They can work if built properly with good filtering on the front end, they can work fairly well, but there are limitations. So now let's talk about the Lynx Easy SW receiver. I was looking for a simple design that would work fairly well. I was wanting something a little better than a direct conversion. I really was trying to get something that would work better than the receiver kits we built. So I was looking to do something that was a super heterodyne, as simple as possible. One of the things that happened was while I was looking and testing, remember the 8831 mixer modules that I was testing and playing around with? While I was playing around with them, I got to realize, and you know, what they are, they are a mixer, and they have some very good specs. They're a very good mixer, actually, but they have an amp built into them. And the purpose of the amp here is just to amp enough to just make up for the losses. So in other words, your signal comes in the mixer, there's losses, and we amp it back up to make up for those losses. And so we end up with a, a basically a lossless mixer that works very well. The low noise amplifier built into them is basically designed around the same designs that 
we use in standalone, what we call mimic amplifiers that we see in a lot of things. Very low noise, quite a bit of amplification. Often you see them, you know, 30, 35 dB amplification. That's what's on this chip already. And since it's adjustable of the amplification, my curiosity was how much can I get out of one of these? So as you saw in one of my previous videos, we played around and was able to get quite a bit of amplification out of one of these chips without it looking bad at all. So my thought was, if, if I've got one chip that can do this, and I didn't do a super heterodyne like this, but instead kind of did a blend of this and this. If we look at this one, it's much simpler. We use a single mixer or single amp, single VFO, but it's not going to be as selective as a super heterodyne. What if we added another mixer over here, made it a super heterodyne type receiver, and we didn't put a detector behind it. We let this act as a BFO, the sec second mixer, so we could receive, you know, AM, SSB, CW. And so, you know, that one chip doing both of these kind of opened up some ideas. And so what I ended up with is this right here. Here's what I came up with. What if we used a mixer amp combination here and here, we used a crystal filter, just like any super heterodyne. We build this crystal filter very simply using just two of those 10K6B crystal filter modules. We use an SI5351 as our VFO and also provide us a BFO to this mixer. And from it, we don't put a detector in there. Instead, we use this as a BFO. We use this sort of like a direct. We bring this frequency down to audio. So this section works much like a direct conversion receiver. This section works much like a super heterodyne. It's kind of a hybrid of the two. We come out and give us a headphone jack so we can plug it into amplified speakers or headphones if we want to. And then I thought, well, you know, these little LM386 modules that I got from Ali are so cheap, we could go ahead and put one of those in and put a cheap speaker in and have a built-in speaker also. So that would be nice, It'd be very inexpensive. So this is the design. Now, one of the problems with this design is we don't have a lot of amplification of the RF. We don't have a lot of filtering in the front end. In fact, because this is intended to be a wide band, I'd have to have a whole lot of bandpass filters in here to be effective. So I don't have any bandpass filtering in here at all. It's wide open. And to do two things, we add an antenna tuner to it. The antenna tuner is in there for two reasons. And one is by tuning the antenna resonant to the frequency we're receiving, what we do is we help not so much filter, but we boost the frequencies. We make it easier for those frequencies to pass than other frequencies. And therefore we kind of act like a weak bandpass filter in the process. And at the same time, when we tune this antenna to resonant, as we've looked at before in the past, your signal strength is going to come up quite a bit. So that almost acts kind of like a minimum amplifier in the front end. So it acts as amplifier, but it doesn't really amplify the frequencies we don't. It amplifies the frequencies we do want. And so this kind of works like the regenerative receiver we looked at and built, where what you're doing is you're looping the frequencies you want back in to be reamplified. This doesn't work that way, but it ends the end effect is similar. The antenna tuner being tuned to the frequency we want boosts the signals we want, downgrades the signals we don't, and matches the impedance of this module to the antenna. So makes makes your signal strength come up dramatically. And so that is what the purpose of the antenna tuner on the easy receiver is for. It's a pretty straightforward design. I don't know what you guys think. I'd love to see some comments and feedback, what you think. Uh, it seems to work on the bench playing around. Um, I tweaked a few AD831 modules and wired everything up. And you know, you've seen me show you demonstrations of some of the reception. So the idea is you throw a good length of wire out the window and hook this thing up and you're, you know, Bob's your uncle, you're, you're good to go. The whole design is designed to run on 12 volts. It's not the most energy efficient from battery point of view. So I didn't really build it to run on batteries. It will run on a battery. Because I built this to be a practical receiver, I went ahead and set it up to use a wall warp. I found a linear wall warp that's not too expensive for 12 volts, so you don't have the noise of a switching supply. And that's my intent. The other units are battery powered, but I've looked at the current from them. Be honest with you, they're not very good battery powered radios. None of them are going to run very long on a battery. They're going to kill batteries pretty quick. So I just didn't even go there. Now, if you want to feed 12 volts in off a battery, you, you can plug your barrel jack to a battery and plug it in and you're good to go. You know about the VFO, you've seen the VFO design, and you know this is it. This is the design, so I'm ready to start building this thing and see if the PCB design works, see what I need to do to get it working, see how good it does work. So let's talk a little bit 
about beyond this design. What's this thing going to look like when it's finished? What kind of case are we going to have? What, what are we going to do? You know, how's things going to fit? Let me get over the bench. We'll talk about that a little bit. Okay, how many of you remember the videos early in my channel when I designed the, uh, the thermal test cell for testing components under te different temperatures and frequencies and such? Well, I was thinking, you know, how do we do a cost-effective case with labeling and everything that wouldn't cost a lot of money? And this came back to mind. Laser cutting and making boxes like this is, is fairly quick. The wood to do this for a small box for this receiver will not be very expensive. And the worst thing about it is, of course, wood's not a very good uh, shield for RF. So, you know, from noise getting in the receiver or such. But, you know, I found a long time ago when I was printing my ham radio cases, uh, I was building a lot of ham equipment like my amplifier and my receiver and my antenna tuner. The way I dealt with it was I 3D printed them and 3D printing would be great except 3D is too, printing is too slow and so it, it would become laborious to try to make a lot of cases 3D printing. And then you've got to come up with a way to label and then you have to, so, so this would be quicker and easier and cost effective. And as far as shielding, you build the case and if you take this conductive copper tape used for shielding guitars. Basically, you peel it back and stick it on like any tape, but the adhesive on the back of this is conductive. So if you overlap it a little bit, you basically create a continuous plane. My thought is, of course, we wouldn't have foam. We don't need insulation. My thought is build a box like this and then just put tape on the inside, razor blade around all the fittings, glue it together. As you can see, I, you can put nice labeling on everything. To, uh, for all the knobs, you, I can laser out the holes perfectly for all of the uh, potentiometers and such. Even the BNC connectors, you know, have the little cutaway slots where it's not totally round so they won't turn. You know, the laser can cut them out perfect where you just put, your, put it in, tighten your nut, you're good to go. We could do this. This would be fairly quick. I don't think it'd be very expensive. So I'd like to know y'all's thoughts on that. And then you could finish it any way you want, stain it or whatever you want. You know, the printing would be on it. You would just stain it, uh, put the tape on, cut the tape out around the edges, put it together. You could even go in and make you a little strip of tape and tape the corners if you want to make sure you get a good connection all the way around. There's no leakage. And that should keep any noise coming in the receiver down to a minimum. In fact, I would recommend you put a little jumper from the ground on the PCB and solder it to the copper. That's what I do in the ham radios, and that brings that copper plane into our ground plane and makes it excellent shields. Works fantastic. I got a 600 watt amplifier over here. I don't have any problem with RF. So it was a thought. It's probably crazy, but hey, I'd like to know you have some input. You guys comment me. Don't be afraid to hit the button and comment. Tell me what you think. This is a crazy idea. You know, no way. I'm not interested. Nobody would ever want to build one of these or this case design or the idea of using wood's terrible or or it's great, it's genius, whatever you want to put. Tell me so I get feedback and I know where to go with the channel in this project. Uh, ultimately, I can build one just the way I want, but I'm trying to build one that other people would enjoy. So give me some feedback. I'd appreciate it. Hey, also hit the like if you don't mind. If you enjoyed this, hit the like. Help us get this channel to grow a little bit. You know, a like goes a long way. If you haven't subscribed, subscribe. So it lets you know when I put out new video stuff. That helps the channel immensely too. You know, the most important thing I need you to do is see me in the next video.